This then is the text for today. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sent this man or his parents that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. May God bless the reading of his word. When a little baby is forming in their mother's womb, it's, it's quite significant, the intricate nature of their development, the hand of God directly involved. And it's quite striking that, that you see very early the eyes begin to develop. In fact, before most people even know they're pregnant, the eyes of that baby are already developed, the cornea, the pupil, the retina. By week seven, they're already developed. And then by week 10, they, they start to form the eyelids that, that cover those eyes to protect them in their mother's womb. And they continue to develop in the womb. And in, then as they're, they're born into this world, there's a, there's a process that have. It takes a year or so for their eyes to, to really get to fully developed. Early on, they, they start to comprehend different colors. They start to make sense of different objects, but it's not entirely clear. And over the course of that first year or so, they begin to learn how to focus and, and focus on individual objects, focus on moving objects, and, and as they, they grow, they, they be able to, to judge distance between things. All of this is a process that, that begins in the womb, and you have nine months of development, and then into the first year, you have a whole another year of development, and the first couple of years, they begin to be able to see. One of the difficult things we have to wrestle with is that there's people like this man in John chapter 9, that at some point in that process, there was an interruption, something that was not of God's intent that broke into the development of this little baby so that he would not be able to see. And so as he was born into this world, he was born blind and lived his life without that kind of development and it was deeply painful for him. Now, we're going to come back to this man born blind in John chapter 9. But before we do, there's another thing that we have to, to recognize before we move into that story. So, in, in particular, each one of us who knows Jesus Christ as our Savior, there's, there's something that happens in our life. When, when we come to know Christ and su to surrender to him, John 3 says, we are born again. Now, Nicodemus struggled with this idea of being born. He's, 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 he's coming back to Jesus and said, well, I don't climb up back into my mother's womb, do I? And Jesus said, no, that's not what we're talking about. We, we have to move you from the imminent to the transcendent, out of the temporal into the eternal. And, and he, he's, he's telling John there, as he tells all of us, that in this new birth, there is a transformation in your life. It's where we ended last week. Jesus didn't die just so you could get out of jail free card. Jesus died so that your life would be transformed into something wholly different. A big piece of the change that occurs in your life is that as you are reborn, you are given new vision. There, there is a different eyesight that comes with the power and presence of Jesus Christ in your life that you see things differently now that no one else sees. Those that are of the world can't see. They're blind to it. God opens your eyes to truth and realities that are beyond yourself and beyond the temporal so that God begins to open our eyes to the angel choirs that sing above us. God begins to open our eyes to the workings of God on this earth so that we can then see spiritual realities that are blinded to those who don't yet know Jesus Christ. And in this new life that you're given, 
as you're reborn in Jesus, your vision begins to change. The difficulty for a lot of us is we, we struggle to grow out of those infancy stages so that the vision becomes clearer and clearer. But as we grow in Jesus, that, that vision begins to develop so that we see things as God sees them rather than as we see them. Apart from God, our vision is blurred at best, but, but ultimately we are blinded apart from Jesus Christ to the present reality that's around us. And Jesus says, in your new life, you will see. That's why we pray together as a church, God, give us eyes to see. We have known widespread blindness even within the church itself because we've remained in infancy and our prayer is Jesus help us grow up so that we can see that which is of heaven so that we can see and know truth. As we come to the story of the man born blind, Jesus makes it clear from the beginning that his disciples, they cannot yet see. We recognize their blindness in the question that they ask Jesus. They come to Jesus, they see this man blind and they say, Jesus, we see he's blind. We know blindness is a product of sin. His suffering has to be a product of sin. So, Jesus, help us understand, is it A or is it B? So that they give Jesus a multiple choice here. So, Jesus, the sin that affected this man's eyesight, did it come from him as a baby in the womb? Did he sin like Jacob? Or... Is this a direct result of choices his parents made and his parents affected him in the womb so that he was blind? It has to be one of these two. And so they come before Jesus and say, which one is it? We want to know where the direct connection is. And we must say this. They come by this, by these options, honestly. Because these are likely scenarios. In fact, you might even say these are the most likely scenarios, that they're so likely that blind people could find them. And this, these blind people come and say, we know sin dramatically impacts our life. We all, we all know this. We've experienced. We, we are sinful people. Not one of us is good. No, not one. So in that, we have known direct consequences of our own sin. Often the pain that's in our life, the suffering that we endure when there's chaos in our families, most of the time we bring it upon ourselves. It's a direct result of our own decision making. It's a direct result of our own sinfulness. Most of the issues and most of the pain that we deal with is a direct result of our own sinfulness and we have to deal with that and we recognize it. So that is a real possibility here. Even a parent doing something they shouldn't have done that affects a baby in the womb. It happens all, all the time in this world. It's, it's not good, it's not right, but we as people make bad decisions and it not only affects us, it affects the people around us, even babies in the womb. And so they're coming to Jesus and say, well, it's gotta be one or the other. It has to be one of these things. These are the most likely scenarios. And Jesus begins to open their eyes a little bit. Like little babies, he helps them begin to see new objects, new colors, new distances. He helps them move beyond the imminent to the transcendent. He says, there's something more here. You bring me A, B, but let me show you C. Those are likely scenarios in a general sense, but here in this specific moment, this is not true of this, young, of this man in this instance when he was a baby. Now, we have to be careful with, with this in a couple of different ways. See, one of the ways we have to be careful here is suffering is always directly connected to Satan. Suffering is always a product of the brokenness of this world. It, it's of evil. Now, Jesus is saying it's not a direct result of decisions that this man made or his parents made. It's not a direct result. But indirectly, it always comes back to the evil that Satan works in this world and the brokenness of this world, the pain that we experience, comes back to that kind of brokenness one way or the other. But Jesus says, let, Jesus says to them, let me show you a different way here. That it, it wasn't a direct cause. It was an indirect cause, but it wasn't a direct cause. And there's something greater happening in this moment that you need to see. And, and so he, he takes them back to something similar that we learned a couple of weeks ago in Romans chapter 8. 
that though there is brokenness in this world and each of us go through intense times of suffering, our own kind of valley of the shadow of death, but what God does in his children as the spirit of God comes upon them, he opens their eyes to new realities in the presence of their suffering that their, present, their suffering can be transformed into something much greater, that God can redeem their suffering for the sake of the kingdom of God, that God's gonna bring glory out of their pain, and that, that as Jesus works healing in their life, something incredible happens. The glory of God is put on display so that all can see the power of God in this way and in this life. So Jesus says, there, there's... Answer C, it's not A, it's not B. The answer C is the glory of God is about to be put on display so that no one else in this world can take credit. You're gonna see the power of God. God's gonna redeem this man's suffering and it is going to lead us into rejoicing. See, this is, this is, what, God, this is what God does. And out of Jesus' answer, this is what he wants us to see, that the Spirit transforms your vision, the Spirit transforms your imagination so that your present suffering, you see the potential for God's glory. And as our suffering has deepened to the point where we recognize our own weakness and, and our own um, inability it brings all the more glory to God. One of the things that we learn about this man in the text in John 9 is he was born blind. As he grew up, or as he grew up one of the things that we understand in this, there were, there were many times he likely sought help and no one of this world was able to help him. There was no way he could fix it on his own. There was no doctor in that day who could fix him. There, there was no earthly solution for this man's blindness. It, we assume and understand that all earthly options were exhausted. And it's in those moments when all earthly options are exhausted that you have this perfect opportunity for the glory of God to shine brighter than anything else on this earth, when God comes down and meets this man and heals him in this moment, what man could not do, God could do in an instant. What is impossible for you, God can do right now. What you need is available in the power and presence of the Spirit of God. If we would cry out to our Savior, we will be redeemed. And this is the work of the, the Spirit in this man. You see, if there was any way he could have taken credit, he would have. Because that, that's what we do. Or we'll say it this way. In general, that's the way we behave. If there is a solution that we could fix on our own, we will generally take the credit for that. If there's, there's something, if we come up in our intellect, a way to solve a problem, if we come up in, in our work, a way to fix something, we likely will want to receive the credit for that which is done. If something is successful, we want the credit for that thing. Jesus is saying these deeply painful situations in our lives, they're perfect opportunities for the glory of God to be put on display because these are times when God receives all of the credit for that which is happening. When, when this man is healed, God receives the credit for this healing. And the same thing, and this is what, another way the Spirit gives us new vision is when something good happens in our life, when, when we're healed, even from the smallest of things, or something good, something happens in our life that's good and holy, we don't take credit for it anymore. We see the hand of God involved in it, and we give God the glory for that which is happening. When some, all good and perfect things come from above and the Spirit helps you see that so that you don't take credit when something good happens or something good happens in your life, but immediately you lift your eyes up and in gratitude you praise the Lord for His work in your life, for any kind of healing, for any kind of good moment, any kind of good gift. You say, this must be of our God above. 
And you know, this is one of the ways the Spirit is working in us. When, when we move from this sort of pride into gratitude, it means the Spirit's working. That, that's one of the things that we're watching for when we pray for revival in this place is gratitude, where we stop taking credit for things and we look up to God and say, praise His holy name. Our God has given goodness to us as a body. And as we move from pride into gratitude, it is a work of the power of the Holy Spirit among us. And that's what we long for. God receives all the glory for that which is good. Now, when we're younger in the faith, when we're little infants in Jesus, it's not only our vision that's a bit blurred, it's also our, our, um, our, how we perceive the people around us. Because one of the things that we think when we're younger in the faith is that if God does a miracle, everybody will erupt in rejoicing. It will lead to wonderful things. Everybody will come to Jesus if there's a miracle. Time and time throughout Scripture, we see that's not the case. And Jesus even says as much that when, when miracles happen, there's widespread blindness around us. In fact, one of the things that happens when, when a miracle happens among us, it reveals how blind we are. It reveals how, how dark the heart is. Because if you work down through the rest of the story in John chapter 9, so the rest of the story, you see a number of reactions to this miracle. Jesus heals the man. He jumps up and he wants to give witness to the power of Jesus in the whole community. This man is a part of that community. They know who he is. He knows who they are. He's been blind from birth. There is this healing. And he wants to celebrate this, this healing with the whole community. And as you work down through this whole story, People don't want to celebrate with him. In fact, people do everything that they can to discredit and dismiss the power of Jesus in this man. It starts with the townspeople. As he runs into town and he starts to celebrate, I've been healed, the townspeople say, say must be a lookalike. He must be playing a trick on us. He got somebody that looked like him, to dress like him, to come in and say, I'm healed, so that he can fool us into thinking something happened. Why in the world would a man blind from birth try to trick the community and bring in a lookalike to say, I am healed? When people are blind, these are the kinds of explanations they come up with for the power of God in our lives. So the blind people say, well, it must have been a lookalike. Then he moves on. The, the Pharisees, they're going to hold court to try to figure out what happened because now it's disrupting the whole community. When Jesus comes in and Jesus does something powerful, everybody has to respond to it. They, they can't be dismissive of it. They've got to respond to it because the power of Jesus is so brilliant. Everybody in the community responds in some way and it reveals their heart. And the Pharisees are right in the middle of that and saying, Jesus must be evil. Now, no, this takes mental gymnastics to get there, but because they don't want to know Jesus, because when you experience Jesus on a personal level, he transforms your heart and you have to change. You have to come to repentance and your life is transformed when you meet Jesus. The Pharisees, they did not want to change. They did not want their heart changed by Jesus. And so they did everything that they could to dismiss him and discredit him so that they didn't have to listen to him. And in, as they're discrediting Jesus, in their own way, they said, Jesus must be evil. And so this act must be evil. And so we must punish him for this evil act of healing this blind man. It makes no sense. But that's their line of reasoning for discrediting Jesus so that they didn't have to listen to him. How often are we blinded in that way and we refuse Jesus and we try to discredit what Jesus is speaking into our hearts and lives because we don't want to change. We don't want to be different. We're comfortable where we are. And as Jesus disrupts their comfort, they run away from the power of God so that they could remain exactly as they are. But when you, when you know Jesus and you experience the presence of Jesus in your life, you cannot remain the same. You can't stay as you were. And keep, keep moving. Even his parents. His parents should have been most excited that their baby boy is now able to see. They should have been rejoicing with him. But what, what, are, what do his parents do? His parents start distancing themselves and say, we don't know what's going on. He's our son and he is healed, but we don't want anything to do with him. They were completely dismissive of it, and they wanted to divert attention from themselves. The scripture says they were just scared. His parents were scared. They didn't want to deal with this anymore. 
When Jesus came in, it was such a powerful moment in the life of that community. Fear overwhelmed this man's parents. So they hid even from Jesus himself. But then we get down to verse 38. I want you to look at verse 38 with me, John 9, 38. Because this is the appropriate response to Jesus. And as this works out, this is, this is the one specific example that we see of, of responding to Jesus as we need to. John 9, 38. And so this is the man who was formerly blind. And he says to Jesus, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. You see, there's no other response. When, when Jesus comes into our midst and, and does wonderful and powerful things, this is our response. Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. See, what's happening is his, his eyes are beginning to open. They aren't fully open yet, right? It's, it's as a baby's eyes that are forming through time. His eyes are opening, and he's starting to see, and one of the first things he sees is the power of Jesus right in front of him, and he says, yes, I believe. And he sees Jesus for who he is. This is one of the first things that God does for us. It allows us to see Jesus for who he is. The son of God crucified for our sin who brings us healing. Deep spiritual healing necessary for each and every one of us. And this man says, yes, I believe. And he is transformed in worship that day. And that, that's our prayer o over ourselves as a congregation, that God would open our eyes, that we would see Jesus for who he is, that God would open our eyes, that we would see our problems for what they are, that God would, would open our eyes, that we would see the spiritual reality around us, the spiritual reality that's in us, chariots of fire, angel armies on the horizon, the Spirit of God sweeping through the church of God doing mighty things that only God deserves the credit for. That's our prayer together as a church that this is who we would be. Open our eyes that we may see. Let's pray. Lord, would you do that? Lord, would you open our eyes that we may see as a mighty rushing wind, as tongues of fire, as a dove. Lord, open our eyes that we can see the power of your spirit in this room. Lord, we ask that you would heal our eyes and remove our blindness. Lord, would you come? It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This year at the First Baptist Church of San Antonio, we're looking deeper into the second greatest commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. When we love our neighbors well, we build a stronger, more connected community. And this community includes you. Whether you're in the city limits of San Antonio or watching all over South Texas, we want you to be a part of this with us. Come be a part of what God is doing in the heart of downtown San Antonio.